if my dad isn't here caring for me, there's something inherently wrong with me. And, and however you internalize that as a little person, it carries over unless somebody heals you from that emotion. And so I took that with me into the beginning of addiction. Tell me how it, how it impacted you growing up without a father. It was horrible, but because I was so small and your parents are like the giants in your life, right? You don't know what that feeling is. You really, really don't know what's going on. But there, I think there is an inbred need in little girls to have their father, you know? And so you kind of get driven by that need, the need to have him touch you appropriately, but to be there when you have some kind of a milestone and uh and and if they're my father was a very precious man he was very smart he was a composer he was an architect he was a musician so he, he was very very bright and he had whatever his brokenness was that he brought with him um that translated to me and my brothers too eventually but um his idea was, I guess, what we talked about, a lot of men's ideas. They need to make a lot of money to make their family happy, when in reality, we need them. And the money is secondary. And most people don't understand that because we're all about what car we drive, what house we live in, what clothes we wear, and care. I mean, I cared, but I more wanted my dad. I wanted my daddy to come home from work. I wanted you to come home from work while I was still awake. You know, and I would sit. My mother was very caustic, and it, it would be um, really hard to be with her all day without Dad there. And so I looked so forward to his coming home at night and, and being with me to the best of his ability. But I knew once he got home, there was going to be some kind of disruption between my parents. So I wanted to get him before we went in the house. So I would sit on the curb and wait and wait in way, not every time, not every time, but enough times that it impacted my heart that I'm waiting for my dad and he's not here and I need him. But you're a little bitty kid, how do you tell him that? You can't, you don't know that that's what that is. You know, and, and my dream was just daddy come home, be happy, my parents have a conversation. And this is a lot more sophisticated thinking now than I was doing then, but I could pop up in his lap, you know, he could read me a book or, you know, what was his day like or what was my day like, you know? And, and because of that kind of abandonment, my dad was very um, self-centered and I don't believe it was by choice. I believe it was uh, pain driven and uh, emotional pain. So when, when you're totally involved in self, there was no way for you to give to the people around you. So um, I made a decision to become invisible, very quietly become invisible. And the only time I felt like I had any pliability as a human being was when my dad was around. And if I could hold my dad up as a standard, it was awesome. But he needed to be there. So times that he wasn't there, which was more often than not, was excruciating, excruciating. If I had a choice between a father verbally telling me he loved me and the other choice would be actions I would choose the action over the words you can tell me all day long that you love me and I hear that and it goes into my spirit but until you show me something until you're there for me or until you come home and take me to lunch until you make me the most important thing in your life for a moment you can tell me you love me forever, but it confuses me. What does that mean love is? Is telling me you love, is that love? Because see, I, I ran with I love yous for the rest of my life. And you can have people everywhere tell you they love you and buy into the words and then them not back it up with action. So it tends to recreate that same level of pain again and again and again because you don't have the experience to say, well, I really am glad that you love me and I believe that you do, but could you show me? 
you don't get there. You don't know that that's part of the process. That's what love is. Love is being there. Even if it's for a certain amount of time on a daily basis, if it's just for a weekend, if it's something that makes your daughter feel like she fits in the family system. You know, it seems like men gravitate toward their sons naturally because it's male to male. And I think fathers are very awkward with their daughters sometimes. I think they see us as so fragile sometimes, and they don't know quite what to do with this, you know? And, and it, it requires a little bit more of a stretch to be there with your daughter. You know, I know that it does be, and the only experience I have with that is being there for my grandson, because that's the only boy in my life. And it's much easier for me to know exactly what to do with Zoe, but when it comes to Caleb, I'm like, what do I say now? You know, what does he need me to do? And I think it's just so important if a father would ask his daughter, what do you need from me? What can I do for you? You need me to be at your play this weekend? You know what? It's on the books, and I don't care what happens. I will be there no matter what. Yeah, I'll leave my cell phone in the car, you betcha. There won't be any texting. You are the apple in my eye. And have that father sitting there on whatever row he is with the big grin going, that's my little girl. You know, that's my baby girl, and I'm so proud of her. It doesn't take a lot. It really doesn't take a lot. It just takes a minute. You know, and it's just so important. What are the good things you learned from your dad? I got his sense of humor, which he was absolutely hysterically funny. He was very sensitive, and I appreciated that in him. And, and, and I just want to say this. I think a lot of men don't think they can show sensitivity, and that was one of my favorite qualities about my dad. I was so grateful that he would feel feelings. And um, he, his musical ability, the things that I grew up with, um, I was so proud of his art. You know, the, the, there's a lot of joy for me in music, and there's a lot of joy for me in art, and I, that came from my dad and my mother as well, but that is who daddy was, you know. And uh, when I was little, I don't do sports things at all because that wasn't part of our family. We listened to opera when people were playing sports, which was just, that's just what I grew up knowing. I was never encouraged to play sports and probably a really good thing because I really was bad at sports. But, um, you know, he just had so many awesome qualities, but such a brokenness that when those things happened, they were like the best of the best. And, and for those things, I was so proud of him. But I think what I wanted from him that he wasn't able to give was to feel the same proudness of him for me. And I felt it sometimes, but if it could have been a, a structured, ongoing relationship where it happened in my life more than once or twice, that I would have that to grasp hold of, because you, we all want approval. We most definitely want approval from our fathers. And I never felt like I wasn't approved of. I just felt unnoticed. And that hurts. The disconnect between, we talked about I love you, him saying it, showing it. How about as far as, did he ever say I'm proud of you? And how did that, was it similar? It was similar, and he did say it. Uh, I, I'm, a lot of it I don't remember. I, I do remember him being proud of me. Uh, my aunt had a ballet school here in town, and Daddy did all the uh, artwork and the backdrops and stuff. And when I was 16, I helped him do a character for one of the numbers. He was just overjoyed with that. And when I was did my ballet stuff, he was really proud about that. Um, but as I got older and I uh, began to sing some, he was very, very proud of that. He didn't understand that. I had that ability. And it's not that he didn't get it. It's just that you've got to be there in your child's life. When they start having their dreams, they start becoming a reality in their heart. They need somebody to support them in their dream. And then early on when you're, you're trying to step into those things, you need the approval of your parents. 
the particularly your father, I think. What do you wish your dad would have done differently? Honestly, what I wish he would have done differently was care more about himself, seriously. Because if he'd had the tools that he needed to care for him and his brokenness, there wouldn't have been something that I needed. It would have been there, you know, because his lack of love for himself and the confusion that comes behind that was where he lived in his mind. But I believe if he had had a strength, courage, and wisdom that you find in Christ, that he would have been a different man, and I wouldn't have to tell you what it was that he wasn't able to give me. You know, I mean, it's it's a myriad of things that didn't happen. And, and then some of the things that did happen that were quote-unquote good were awkward and off-center. I made some comments one Christmas about wanting a football helmet. You know, but I really didn't mean that because what I got for Christmas, a football helmet. And when he gave me that helmet, he got in touch with instantly that that was not the right gift. But if he had been uh, walking with me closer, he would have known that was me being silly and that this is this is a little girl. I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, I'll give her the football helmet as a joke, but this is what she really wants. What's the best advice that you could give fathers as it pertains to daughters? Be present in their lives. You know, if it means that you've got to do something different, if you have to give up an activity, um, if you want to go somewhere with the guys that you've already made plans with and she comes to you and says, Daddy, I really need you to be here, then you'd be willing to drop that. Um, hug her. You know, don't stand away like you can break her if you hug her. That's not true. Giggle with her. Play. You know, don't be, don't be a statue. You know, just don't be this man, you know, and I don't dare do this. Don't go there. Be human. Be hu Don't be the giant. Be a human being with your child, your daughter in particular. You mentioned something a while ago that bothered me. Dr. Mika, this best-selling author that we were able to interview, she said the disconnect for men so many times is, and you mentioned it earlier, this idea that because we don't know what it's like to be a little girl, there's this fear. And so instead of saying, how can I help? What do I need to do? It's like, right. ah, you guys, you know, that's mom. Mom will take mm -hmm. care of that. I'm going to go do this. That's right. That's what exactly what happens. I always think that's just wrong. <laughs> it's just not right because I mean, it's not true. I know it's common. Yeah. I see it every day across the board. I see that more often than anything else. And, and the best fathering and mothering I've seen with a, a family has been watching uh, Pastor Boyd and Pastor Jan take care of Jackie. It's like, that's what it's supposed to be like. These guys are present in her life in every way. And, and it's not to say they're wishy-washy, and it's not to say there is not discipline and structure, because there is. But there is a level of love, understanding, and um, approachability, approachability that you just don't often see. Too many fathers do what you just said. That's mom's job. No, it's not mom's job. Well, it is mom's job to a degree, but mom is with us all the time. You know, mom's on major burnout when dad gets home. Like, take these kids, do something with them. You know, care where you go, <laughs> go to McDonald's, whatever. You know, so heck, take her to McDonald's. You know, make you know, the apple of your eye. A little girl wants to be the apple of her dad's eye. How do you think your life would have been different had you had a father that was engaged in Wow. I have thought about this so many times, so many, many times. Um, my grandparents raised me. I lived at the ballet school from a little girl till I was about four. His daddy was trying to establish himself 
as an architect and was my parents were really involved in this social setting that they really wanted to move up in. So that was an abandonment issue from the get-go. But watching both of them, but Dad in particular, the things that they were able to do through their talents, it astounded me. And if I had it to do again, I would take my dream and run all the way with it instead of sabotaging every good thing that's happened in my life up until my relationship with Christ because I felt not worthy. I felt unlovable. I felt invisible. So if I would have been able to follow through on that, I'm not a perfect family. I certainly am not talking about perfection. I'm talking about feelings. And if I had had their support and their nurturing, the nurturing is so important, then I would have been able to have the freedom to follow through. I wouldn't have been a person that starts strong and finishes last. You know, it would have been an entirely different picture, entirely different picture. And, and because of that, there are so many dreams I've let go of that I, I know I would have been good at. I really know that in my heart. And it's not an ego thing. It's just the dreams that I had. And, and I knew they were accessible, but I didn't have the tools to do it. But I could see it in them. It's almost really if you, and this is something that recently came up that I had not thought about until it came up. My girls, I hope, and I think I've instilled in them that I believe in them. Absolutely. So that it gives them the confidence to go try and do whatever it is, whether it be dreams or whatever. Right. That it, I mean, does that make sense? It makes sense. And you know what that tweaks in my brain is like, a fear to step out there and make a mistake or fall because I didn't have a daddy to pick me back up and dust me off and say, that's okay, it's okay. You know, you can try again or we'll do something else. That was the, that's the disconnect. That's the disconnect. I wouldn't pick myself back up and be like, you know what, this is what you deserve. You got what you deserve because you didn't do it right. But if I had a dad to come up and say, we all fall short, I'm going to put you back on your feet, tell you how proud I am of you. You did a great job. You know, so then you want to try the next thing. But when there's nobody for you on the sidelines, you know, you can't even assess your performance, whatever it is, without that father saying, you missed it, kid. You know, it didn't have to be. You did great. You missed it, kid. You did. You missed it. But you know what? It's all right. What do you wish your dad would have done different? Well, there's really not a lot. It's, it's for me, it, it's a huge issue, but maybe for a dad, it's just not that big a deal. But I've been thinking for a few minutes about that. And uh, obviously to be there when I had something that I accomplished in my life and to be there when I fell, to either pick me up or tell me I could do it. But um, I, I wanna make it really, really clear that my expectation it's is not to expect a father to be there for everything and do everything right. It's not about being perfect, it, but it's about having a real relationship with your child, male or female. But from a female perspective, um, to be real, to just have your dad be real with you for the times that he disappoints. For him to own his part and say, you know, I missed the mark, sweetie. I'm sorry. I wasn't there for you. My heart was there with you, but I know my heart being there with you is not enough. I needed to be there. To learn how to model out for a girl, what is she going to have in a husband later? What are you going to look for? Are you going to do like I did and the first guy that pays attention to you and says, I love you, oh, he's the one? Is that what you're going to do? Because if you don't have any experience to draw from, you don't know what to do. And, and being... At the end of my fourth marriage, um, I look back on that, think, where did I miss it? What is broken in me? And there's a brokenness that comes from not knowing what you need to do next. And not knowing what is the model for a successful relationship, not even marriage, just a successful dating relationship when you get older. Or even beyond that, what's inappropriate? 
this guy said he loves me, so you mean that wasn't okay to do da-da-da-da-da? But he loves me. You know, well, if he loved you, you wouldn't be in a position to have to do da-da-da-da-da. That wouldn't be on the table. So it, it's just critical for a girl because we don't have the same strength as a man. You are our covering, and we need you to cover us. You know, it's not even complicated. It's just building a real relationship with your daughter so that she feels strong enough to say, when somebody says, I love you, and that's all well and good, but show me something. And, and I need you to err on the side of better than, uh-oh, uh almost, you know. I want the better, I don't want the almost. How about the inconsistencies? Oh, the inconsistencies of, well, like I shared earlier, uh, was having Daddy there sporadically, sporadically involved in my life, and a little bit of confusion behind, you can be here sometimes, but not this time, so what is that about? You know, uh, uh, thinking, uh, internalizing it as a little girl, think this is about me, it's about me, I did something that he doesn't want to be here for. You know, I'm going to disappoint him. Oh my gosh, he doesn't want to see me fall because that's going to make him look like not very good, right? So, um, but the times that he was there, and it was an awesome thing, and he complimented me, he was proud of me, he was a beaming father, and then be away, 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 the away time and the inconsistent times of not being there with me when I really needed him made those moments bittersweet because they would be the best time of my life but also the worst because I always knew behind that was going to come a huge lifetime and I didn't understand I didn't understand the empty space I didn't get it if you could say one thing to your father right now what would it be oh I knew you were going to ask me that question <laughs> I knew it I knew it when you asked George that question if, if, if that's a question you don't want to answer? I don't have a problem. No, I want to answer it. Would you just ask it again? <laughs> okay. If you could say one thing to your father right now, what would it be? I love you, Daddy. I love you a lot. You're awesome. And I forgive you for when you weren't there. Forgive me when I wasn't there. Was there something your dad used to say? Was there something uh, that he told you that... that was most memorable? Well, you know what? My dad was Mr. Story. I mean, he was a prolific writer, and he had more stories that were just amazing. I'll tell you what his endearment for me was, Hot Spoofer. He named all of us some funny little name. He named my brother the Royal Zucchini. I mean, I, I don't know. We didn't know what they meant, but I knew I was a hot spoofer. I, I mean, when he said that you're my little hot spoofer, I'm like, you betcha I am. I'm hot spoofer from here to here. Thank you, Daddy. Um, one time, this is probably, this is a very bizarre story to share, but still it made me really proud of him. I, uh, at 17, decided I was going to leave home. I'd already been using since I was 12, and I was definitely at odds with my mom, and I had uh, made a relationship with a musician in a really <laughs> funky, ratty bar downtown, and he was going to Louisiana and wanted me to go. So I announced to my mother that I was going. Well, you can only imagine that she didn't say yes, right? So um, I called my dad, and he came and got me, and he took me there. And we, you know, talked all the way there, and then when we got to where we were going, you know, he's happy-go-lucky daddy, and when we got there and walked inside, he cornered this guy. He said, hi, I'm Bliss Alexander, I just want to tell you this is my baby girl right here. And it, by that point, he hadn't been in my life, oh, maybe just so rarely I can't remember, so for me, I was like, whoa, you know, and so he says, this is my little girl. I love her more than I could ever tell you. You lay a hand on her. You make her shed one tear. You do anything out of the ordinary with my little girl. I'm back in your face, brother. He said, I'll survive Normandy, so I'm pretty sure I'll survive you. So if she calls me, you better move before I get here. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. I think Daddy really does like me because he's like telling this guy the riot act and I'm standing there beaming, you know. And, and because he did that, I left. 
really quickly after that. But I can't disappoint my father with this mess. This is not good. Let me ask you, as far as the addiction is concerned, and just be truthful, if, it, if there's no connection, that's fine. No, it's fine. Do you think there, in any of that, whether it be with the pain or the void or whatever, was any of that related to your father? Absolutely. It was related to the abandonment. It was related to the sense that I took on as damaged goods. Okay, my if my dad isn't here caring for me, there's something inherently wrong with me. And, and however you internalize that as a little person, it carries over unless somebody heals you from that emotion. And so I took that with me into the beginning of addiction. I can honestly tell you, I don't remember a time early on that I was doing it for party's sake. The first time I drank, I, I had a blackout. But when I, the instant that it hit my system, I was like, I'm home. I don't feel nothing but good. And all those voices and all that inadequacy, all the shame, all the invisibility, all those things were gone. They were gone. So it became my quest, in a sense, to make sure I stayed in a state of numbness, however that figured into the equation, so I could continue to feel like those things that hurt so bad were pushed down so far that I could have some semblance of freedom. And it, it, it definitely was a huge factor in my addiction, absolutely. If you had a friend who was going to be a father for the first time, what advice would you give them? Keep your eyes and your ears open. Don't shut off your emotions with your children. Be the real deal. Be who you are, warts and all. That doesn't matter to your child. Don't ever be abusive. Don't ever be abusive. But make sure the boundaries are there. Make sure that structure is there. But never do it from a hardcore angry place. Reach out to your children. Love them. Make sure that physically, emotionally, and spiritually you're fine-tuned so that you don't miss anything in your children's lives. You know, and when you do miss those things, you can step back and say, I missed it, but I'll do better next time. Be a human being to these kids. Don't be a human doing. They don't need a human doing. They need a human being. They need bad. So be there. Be square, kind of, you know. Just be and be approachable above all things. Be approachable. Listen to what their little hearts are saying to you. Let them have your ear. You know, and your heart. Give them your heart. Give them your whole heart. And in so few instances have I seen that acted out in the times that I have. It's so comforting. It seems like it's just such a pattern of what the Lord does with us. You know, and it's such a blessing. And you see those little people, all those perfection in Christ, we walk in imperfection, but you see them, they're always going to look for that. They're going to look for the Father heart of God. I really believe that they will, and that's part of the journey, is having the stability of your parents. But they first have to be seeking. They first have to have that relationship, I think, to complete the whole picture. And I'm not saying that you can't be a good parent if you're not serving Christ. But I'm just saying you're a phenomenal parent if you do. And I want to be a phenomenal parent. If there was anything I would be able to do over again, would be to be a better parent and make better choices. Because every choice I've made, and a lot of times thinking it was just a choice that affected me, affected my children in every area of their life. So that that's really seriously be a man of God first. Love your wife. Show that you love your wife. Show that there, after God, there is nothing more important than your family. And do whatever, however that lines out for you, whatever that dynamic is in your family, then do that. Find out what it is and follow it. And don't beat yourself up when you fall short. And don't ever quit.
don't ever quit. I don't care if your daughter's 70 years old and you're 90. If you never told her you love her, then do it right now. Right now. Don't wait. Love heals a multitude of sins. And it's really true. Really, really true. Watch the Father Effect movie for free on YouTube.